chapter 9 of book 2 is really interesting. Where he talks about, you need to keep in mind the nature of the whole and how you are a part in it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to act in accordance with the whole and your nature as a part. And that really reminded me of Epictetus, always commenting on how you have to keep track of where your place is in the logical whole, fulfill your role there. And I see, I see Marcus Aurelius doing that, doing that a lot, as with the passages that Sarah was pointing out too. There's other part, other part whole um, arguments. Um, as your research has shown, it's not always a very easy prop, uh, uh, Not it's not always very easy to figure out what my part is in the cosmos. So if I sit down and think, what is my role in this cosmos? Of course, I don't. I haven't been through all the lessons about physics and logic that one needs to do. Of course, Epictetus doesn't think I need to do those necessarily, right? To, to figure out my my role, my part. Um, and so, to some extent, all of this stuff about make sure you're doing your part. Um, to, to to me is more mysterious, and for all of you embarking on your life and figuring out what you're going to do with your life and where you're going from here and so forth, and some of you are even graduating and so forth, and so this is really, I won't be one of those guys that asks you what's next, don't worry, but uh, <laughs> that, I mean, this is on your mind. Uh, I mean, it's not very helpful to say, sit down and reflect about your position in the cosmos, I think. Now, Marcus Aurelius is emperor of the Roman Empire, so he has a fairly clearly defined role, and it's important for him to recognize what are the responsibilities of this role, and not be a Nero or a Caligula, um, and failing to do your role because lives and and empires and so forth hang on it. Um, but uh, you know, I think I think here Epicureanism is more intuitive. It's easier to follow. It's not that I've got some part in this grand cosmic structure, it's that I've got these, these rather obvious things, they're called pains, and, I, and, and one needs to get rid of them in order to, in order to be happy. Whereas one, one needs to figure out one's cosmic role. I actually find it to be an anxiety producing <laughs> um, idea, not an anxiety relieving idea. You know, maybe I should be emperor of, of something like Rome. I mean, Marcus, I love Marcus Aurelius. Maybe I should be um, an emperor. And I'm really obviously failing in my role being a lowly like philosophy professor. Um, or, or, or maybe my role really is philosophy professor, and so I need to concentrate everything on, on, on doing that. But how do I know? I have these doubts about it. And as students, definitely have doubts about it. Yeah. In terms of like reflecting on the cosmic whole, couldn't you also get the opposite effect of like not having anxiety? Because like I'm so small in this like gigantic universe, and my role is so insignificant. And then also um, in mind with their like compatibilism, like I think they would believe that like, oh yeah, everyone has this like role from like maybe some kind of preset mm. destination that you're born into, but you can kind of decide how you go about in that role or how you manifest that role, but that role is kind of already set in some way. Um, and I feel like in a more contemporary sense, you can look at it as like everyone kind of has these like set gifts or set natural talents that we have. And reflecting on that in relation to like, you know, the culture or the place you live, how can you best fit that nature into this? Both, both of those points are very good. Okay, this, the second one um, that, you know, don't, don't worry about figuring out whether you should be a philosophy professor or emperor because what you're going to be is determined from the beginning of time and even earlier than that because it's from a set of cosmic cycles that's eternally repeating itself. So in, in a sense my role is exactly what I'm doing and where I'm sitting right now. And by the way I'll see you in the next cosmic cycle right here, everybody sitting in exactly these positions. And then that's not only going to happen again but that's going to happen an infinite number of times. Now, whether you're happy about that or that's a terrifying idea, mm -hmm. most people are terrified. I'm going to be sitting in a room with, I, you, you think you're never going to sit in a room with Monty Johnson again once this term ends. I got news for you. Mm -hmm. Ever heard of infinity? <laughs> um, 
Okay? So, uh, you know, in a sense, your role is exactly where you're at. So concentrate, like uh, Laura was saying, on what you're doing right now and how you're reacting to those things. So I, I, I think that's a really good point, is that they're fatalism. And you put it in a, in a good technical philosophical way, they're compatibilism. Compatibilism means they believe that human freedom is compatible with fate and determinism. And so don't, don't worry about it too, too much about that if <clears throat> the universe and Zeus wants you to be a Roman emperor, you will be. Um, and, that, and that's exactly what will happen. And then your other point, the first point that you made, is also very good, I think. So, and that's that reflect on how small and minute and, and puny you are. And there's all these great times in other fragments here in Marcus Aurelius, who is the most powerful man in the world at the point in time that he's writing, is saying, basically, I'm nothing. This is a speck in the, in the overall scope of this cosmos. And one way to relieve depression and anxiety that, I, that, that is very effective, actually, is to, do, is to do things like reflect on the immensity of the cosmos and the smallness of this. So if you find yourself sort of bummed out, look at some of these NASA pictures that show you vast nebulas and, and things like this, and concentrate on the cosmic scale of things, and it makes your own problem shrink to a vanishing uh, point to some extent when you put them into relation to the you know, infinities of time in both directions that are surrounding you and the, and the vastness of, of the spatial cosmos and so forth. So I, th I, th I think both of those are really um, solid and stoic points, stoic ways of, of, of dealing with this. Now, did somebody else have a hand? Yeah, please. So, um, I know stoics are deterministic. So I had a question about what he means on the fifth paragraph when he says, you will give yourself this if you carry out each act. As if it were your last, free from all randomness. Um, this is this is book two, book two yeah. section five. Okay. I guess what does he mean by randomness in that context? Um. Okay. Um. At every hour, give your full concentration. Um. As a Roman and a man, and I believe that. I, I'd have to check the Greek there, but it probably says human, anthropos, as opposed to on air, but it would be relevant to Dylan's research if it, if it had a gender term there. Can't tell from the translation. Uh, to carry out the task in hand with a scrupulous and unaffected dignity and affectionate concern for others, and freedom, and justice, and give yourself a space from all other concerns. You will give yourself this space, if you carry out each act as if it were the last of your life, freed from all randomness and passionate deviation from the rule of reason and from pretense and self-love and dissatisfaction with what's been allotted to you. Okay, so in part, randomness is glossed by the phrases that follow from that, from the what we call the epexegetical and there, so randomness, i.e. passionate deviation from the rule of reason and from pretense and self-love and dissatisfaction with what's been allotted to you. So dissatisfaction, oh, I'm, I'm, I was born poor, I, I'm a mere UCSD student, I didn't get into Harvard, I, um, uh, I'm not the valedictorian who's going to be giving the graduation speech. All of that is this emotional stuff that's random and inhibits you from playing the best part you can in the immediate circumstances. Um, of course, there's not randomness in the physical sense of like an Epicurean swerve of atoms or something. That isn't possible because everything is, is uh, faded. Um, so it, it doesn't mean some non-deterministic thing. It means basically 
incidental things, concentrating on and thinking about incidental things, like sitting, those of you sitting here checking Facebook messages and, and so forth on your computers, instead of trying to figure out what this wisdom, this ancient wisdom has to tell you about your life, you are deviating into, a, into random things based on passionate desire for a dopamine hit when you see that somebody liked you posting a photo of your cat or whatever. Okay. That's, that is not um, giving your full concentration you know, as a human being, as a student, as a, um, uh, you know, as a mind and so forth on the task that is set, uh, set before you. So um, that's I think that's I think what how to interpret randomness there. Um, not attention to what's essential, but attention to something that's that's incidental and accidental. And that's within your control. You could concentrate on what's essential and, and the possibility of this wisdom and learning something from it right now. Or you could um, be playing Tetris or whatever. Uh, and that's totally up to you. Um, and uh, so this, this piece of advice is meant to focus us on that. Um, OK, other comments? Anything else people just liked or disliked? Um, OK, Noah? I really liked in book two, chapter 16, first line, where he says, um, the human mind is violence to itself, most of all, whenever it becomes as far as it can, you know, growth in a tumor, in a kind of tumor of the universe. But that was really interesting. Um, well, yeah, that's kind of kind of weird imagery, but what, what does this mean? I want to become a tumor on the universe, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's when the mind does violence to itself. I see. Having resentment and so forth turns you into this into this hideous tumor on the universe instead of being a a, a, a a functional, healthy part of the universe. So we're all part of the universe, and we know that the universe is alive because if part of something is alive, then the whole of the thing is alive, right? And we know part of it's alive because we're part of it and we're alive. So we know the whole thing must be alive. And the question is, are we, are we healthy parts that are making it function and flow in a continuous way, or are we something more like a tumorous outgrowth on the universe? So I mean, I, I, I'm interpreting that with their organistic conception of the whole cosmos. Because it's bizarre to say that you're a tumor on the universe. It's like a really insulting thing to say, right? But if you think that the universe is an organism, then there is some kind of logic to that uh, idea. But what, what is it that you liked about this? Just that, that turn of phrase, or? I thought the phrase was really interesting, and just Again, referencing your own place in terms of the whole, and not trying to justify yourself and like just on your own basis, but like justify how you live in reference to everything as a unity. Okay. Now, Michael, you also raised your hand. What, which one do you like? Um, uh, section three in book three, where it talks about like all the deaths and so. So it's Hippocrates curing right. illnesses and then Philip Dillon died himself and like so on. Like, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of like I don't know, it's kind so of So all these all these great all these great people, much greater than you, have have died. <laughs> um pretty terribly easy or something. Democritus was killed by lice. That's, that, 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 that was invented by somebody in the Hellenistic age to make fun of him. And then, and then he says, and Socrates by lice of another kind, meaning the accusers in democratic Athens who had him put to death. So that's just a kind of clever insult. Um, so why are you reminding me that all these great 
people have died. Well, one thing, it is good to remember that, because it actually alleviates fear of death to some extent. So why am I so worried about the fact that I'm going to die? People a lot greater than me uh, have died. And also, it's universal. Um, but then he says, uh, what does it amount to? You came on board, you set sail, you've now reached land, stepped ashore. Um, I think came on board, stepping on board the ship is like being born, right? Sailing is living through life, and then you're reaching the end of it. It's like reaching land. And then what do you do when you reach land? You don't stay on the boat and say, oh no, you step ashore. Um, and then there's a couple of options. If you come to another life, okay, so if you are reincarnated as something else, nothing is empty of gods even there. So that will still be a good fate to have. You'll still have this portion of the divine even in that case. If you come to unconsciousness, okay, so if death is, like some people think, some sort of deep sleep where we're not even aware of it, there's no perception, it's just kind of oblivion, then you won't be subject to pains and pleasures. Of course, pains and pleasures are just as bad on, on this stoic thing. You might, you might think, well, it's, I, it's, it's a relief to think I won't have pains, but it's a bummer to think I won't have pleasures. But remember, pleasures are bad emotional states, too. You'll no longer be the servant of a vessel as inferior in value as that which serves its superior. One is mind and the guardian of spirit, the other earth and blood. Um, and he, not, not, not in these books, but in other sections, goes in for this kind of language a lot, that we're just flesh and phlegm and, and some bones if you take away mind. But like mind is the only you gotta you gotta concentrate on mind and identify everything with mind because the rest of this stuff is just this this horrible um, sort of grotesque bodily functions that inevitably break down over time. Now I I um, really like the first one of book. Two, and I read. I was reading this on the bus yesterday before I got off the bus and went into a meeting with someone who I would exactly describe as being meddling, ungrateful, violent, treacherous, envious, and unsociable. And so this actually worked as a effectively worked as a consolation for me. And the entire meeting, I was thinking. We have to find a way to cooperate. This I, I, I should not become angry. And what I want to do is just insult this person or put them in their place. I want to figure out a way that this will be like mutually beneficial. And manage to turn around the, the meeting and the outcome. And it actually improved. And I felt better about it afterwards. But it was just random that I happened to be reading this preparing for today, and then went into to a meeting with an upper administrator, um, that this fit. And, and, and so this is one of these things, these pre-meditations, one is supposed to reflect on in the morning. Don't just, don't just, you know, grab your, put on your shoes and grab your backpack and run out into that scary world. Think before you go into it, okay, look, I'm going to come across people that are really going to piss me off and that I don't respect at all and that are going to make me mad. And they are um, envious and treacherous people and so forth. Um, but I've got to find a way to work with that. I mean, first of all, I've got to find a way to not make it affect me and so that I'm not undermining myself by feeling emotion, but also by not being able to carry out my plans because I can't cooperate with this person because of these attitudes I have about them. And so if, if, if one thinks that,
then it might be that you don't come across someone like this. You might somehow be lucky enough not to come across an envious person here in the day. Good luck in Southern California, you know. But, um, but you might, and then that would just be a happy thing. It'd be like you prepared yourself for this outcome, and then it wasn't actually a problem. But the thing is, is that it always is a problem. And there always are people like this. There's people that don't give up their seat on the bus to a, you know, a crippled elderly person that, that they should have done. And it's going to make you angry. But you've got to find a way. You've got to realize not only are we all in the same boat, but we're all like parts of the same universe here. Uh, and and, and the, the, the existence of that vice and so forth is a problem for me too, and I have my own vices that are setting other people off, my own kind of envy and jealousy and so forth, that when other people encounter me is exactly what they're, what they're um, thinking. But you know, this is, this is one of these, remember that all of this, none of this was meant to be published. This all should have been burned, right? If, um, if these underlings had carried out the instructions they were given. But this is this man's personal journal. He's just writing these, these reflections to help himself get through really troublesome times on a big campaign in foreign lands and so forth. Um, and I just think, what a, what, a, what, a, what a wise thing to think, and that it could actually really help you get through, get through the day, to meditate on this ahead of time. Yeah? Um, I related that part to this um, cognitive behavioral therapy technique called like, imagery-based uh, exposure, where you pretty much, like, it's used for like, PTSD and like, social anxiety and different things, where you, like, you imagine yourself in a situation and let yourself feel all the feelings that you would feel kind of like soft suit in that moment and realize like you're going to be okay. So when it actually does come, you are way less affected by it. It's kind of like exactly what the most great Right, is. okay. So and this, is, this is a sort of example of one of them. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I kind of want to loosely connect what you said to section four of book three, the first line. Uh, do not waste the remaining part of your life in thinking about other people unless you're doing so with reference to the common benefit. I mean, thinking about what such and such a person is doing and why what he is saying and thinking and planning all such things which make you wander from looking after your own ruling center. Um, yeah, essentially, I feel like I do this to myself a lot too, where I spend a lot of time thinking about what others believe and think, or mainly about me rather than like focusing on myself and centering myself and trying to see what effect I have on the world rather than like trying to make my, myself out to be what I feel others want me to be. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like resonate to what she said, how um, maybe like I disagree with the way other people think, do things in their life, and that like kind of like angers me. But rather just like making sure like that doesn't have an effect on me, and knowing what's like true to me and what's good to me. Well said. Um, and 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 it turns out that um, other people. You can count on other people being so self-absorbed that they aren't actually thinking about you, and they don't actually care. I mean, even people close to you are too worried about their own lives, and, and in a healthy way, if 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 they if, if if they really concentrate on it. But one can certainly waste a lot of time being concerned with how you're perceived or other people.